that in Kanyang. Yeah. So I wanted to do it last time, but I didn't dare because the language is so difficult. Now this is this one. Okay. And it's, it's interesting because it's a poem <coughs> about where language is. Now, I am from a region that's a little bit north of that, so my mother, my Alemanish is not as good, and it's sort of like, I'm, I'm from like Mannheim Heidelberg, <coughs> and this is from a little bit further south, and uh, of course Yiddish is based on, on Oberbayerisch and Alemanisch, but I will try to read it, so just that you have some sense um, what it sounds like. Dir für die in der Wasche Sprache, die schwächt mit Korn, die Gott genug, in der er dich da horn. Da geht es jetzt, die kann ich nur mehr brauchen, wer da wird Platz. Zu denen muss ich aber durch. Das muss von diesem, selbst von dem, als ein kleiner Karsch noch näher. Ich weiß auch genau, von wem ich froh bin, aber ich kann es kaum mehr gehen. Okay, now that is the language he grew up in. And now listen to what this sounds in high German, and you will already see that you have die Glossia here. Okay, you have double, uh, 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 double language. He has already speaks two languages. So when he is a German writer, that to him is already means that he is reaching for an idea. I have told you for five years now that, that German <coughs> literature is an artificial creation and that everybody has to think that you are at home in a region, but what you are aiming for is an idea, the idea of Germanness. And it's created, not politically, it's created in literature. And this is important to see, and this has something to do with the book we're not reading today, uh, Tod eines Kritikers, The Outsider in Tod eines Kritikers, uh, the book that created such a scandal in 2002, speaks how? With an Eastern European accent. Okay? To be in all of German literature, to be German, to be accepted as a German, was to speak perfect German. Remember now what I told you when we were doing Lessing, uh, <coughs> Nathan der Weisen. And the great shocker that Lessing produced, his very first play, uh, uh, Der Weisen, or Die Juden, or what was it was called, Die Juden, <coughs> where the shock was what? That the Jew who was on the stage was indistinguishable from all the other Germans that were presented, that he didn't speak Jewish. And that was a shock, because to be a German meant to speak German in a in German perfectly. And here, the, the, the Germans were presented with a Jew who spoke just like them. And it was scary, because what now? We can't recognize them anymore. That was Lessing's first play. Absolute scandal at the time. Now, Weiser is very much aware, and this means, this now I am defending his nationalism is actually a form of idealism, uh, is actually where that he speaks just like that. And you will hear in his accent that he has a very strong R. It's very clear where he is coming from. And so it's very clear in his um, idealization of Germany that this is not an exclusive idea, an, an, ex an excluding idea, but it's something to reach for. It is something that is constituted as an idea, not as something that has any physical reality because it means there are so many regionalisms, but you need to have, as in the idea of America, something that holds it all together. So there is some idea of German literature that you can reach for, something to ask him actually. So what does this mean? What does the Mundart mean to you? Why are you not writing the Mundart? Now let's go to the, to the meaning of the poem. Okay? Ganz tief in dir drin hast du eine Sprache. You can see how different that sounds. Die sprichst du mit niemandem. Die geht dir nach. Oder du kannst sie, die kannst du nicht vergessen. Die geht dir nach. In dir bist du daheim. Deep inside you have a language that you cannot talk with anyone. But you also cannot forget it. You are at home in it. Da gibt es Sätze, die kannst du nicht mehr verwenden. Wörter wie Klötze, zu ihnen musst du hinuntertauchen. There are sentences that you cannot use anymore. There are words like, um, like some concrete blocks, concrete blocks. You have to dive down to them. 
Das hast du von diesem, das von einem anderen. Als Kind kannst du noch nehmen. Ich weiß ja genau, von wem ich was habe, aber ich kann es niemandem mehr weitergeben. Okay? Um, I, I know from, from whom I have what, uh, but as a child you can take. And I know exactly what I got from whom, but there's no one to whom I can pass it on. Okay, so you have a definition of language that is very deep down, that is connected to a community, but you cannot talk this language to anyone anymore because there's no one who will still speak it. That means there is a private language buried deep down in you that is associated with memory only. And that is in the link that I sent to you to the Bay Alpha movie about, about him. He says, he's asked, how do you define Heimat? And he said, Heimat is not something that you have now. You know, is he a Heimat dichter? Heimat is not something that you have now. Heimat is something that you have lost. It exists only in memory. And as I was fighting more, I was thinking, that's really stupid. Um, because if I go to the Bodensee, I feel at home. This is Heimat. And I was thinking, he is absolutely right. Because the sensation of being at home has to do with what you remember from your childhood. It is based on the past. It can only exist in the past. Therefore, another qualification, qualified for his nationalism, no such thing. It is something constituted only in the past, doesn't exist now. And that's what Sprache is. This language that no one speaks anymore is a language that is entirely silent, but it is the most private core of himself. It's constituted by community. He's, I got this from this one and another thing from another one. So he was in a community that constituted his sense of self, associated with this language, but now it is very deep inside him in a core that can no longer be articulated. Why you no longer be articulated? Because no one speaks this language anymore. If, you, if he were to write like this, he, would, he wouldn't be who he is. So I just want, as within that uh, tiny little community of some thousand people, yeah. it could still be communicated. I go to Basel all the time. I never hear this language. It would be a very interesting um, thing to ask him who still speaks that. I know that he's very engaged in uh, Alemannische Literaturfest and that he is uh, fördern, uh, that he is supporting artists who write like this. But we do know that what has won out is the, is the high German. But this language is where he's at home. But it's at home is only in the past. What's most interesting about this, because now if I'm forcing you to think about silence, think about, go back to section three of Mutterson, to Feynman. Think about silence. Think about that this entire book, uh, Mutterson, which is so much about language. People talk in that book all the time in various ways. Um, and it is a huge sweep of the use of language from the talk show, he will read us something that's very peripheral, in fact, to the book. We know what he's going to read. He's going to read the talk show section, which is 111. Okay, that's right before 112 is, um, uh, no, 112 is, is, is a talk show. The last section of, the, of, of section one, of part one, is a talk show. Susie and Fred are interviewing, <coughs> are interviewing Percy, and Percy has just given his sermon in, 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 in chapter 11 which is all about being present and not being prepared. And then we get into the talk show section where we have the public use of language. So you have uh, use of language. In fact, when he's looking at the Caravaggio, when, uh, when uh, Feynman is looking at the Caravaggio paintings, those paintings are completely silent. Let's, we would, we, let's, let's look at those again. Um, those paintings are completely silent. The exchange between the pilgrims and the Madonna looking down, 